Good morning. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Shirley Abraham for a talk on endocrine disorders and pregnancy. Dr. Shirley Abraham graduated from the Stony Davies School of Biomedicine and the Sunny Stony Brook School of Medicine. She completed her internal medicine residency and fellowship in hypertension and lipidology at the NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Abraham completed a fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Abraham is currently an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Bone Disease at Mount Sinai. She sees patients in the FDA Mount Sinai Diabetes Center, and she works with fellows and residents in the Diabetes and Endocrine Clinics, Inpatient Consult Services, and High Risk OB Clinic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cheryl Abraham. Thank you for inviting me to give this Grand Rounds presentation, and thank you for that introduction. So today I'd like to talk about endocrine disorders in pregnancy, mainly focusing on the two most common areas, which are diabetes and thyroid diseases. And this is my special interest because there's a special opportunity here with women of childbearing age to help make lifestyle modifications and improve on uh, medications that can um, impact them for the future and also their next generation. I have no disclosures. My objectives are to assess the most common endocrine disorders affecting pregnancy, diabetes and thyroid diseases, and identify not just what happens during pregnancy, but also what are the preconception goals for women who are planning pregnancy, and then also the parameters for follow-up after uh, the postpartum period. So this is a sculpture in Portugal by Fernando Botero, and this style of boterismo is known for figures of large exaggerated volume. We can see this image of a mother and child and when I see this I also think of an increased risk of diabetes. <laughs> so I'd like to start with the case. This is a 36 year old woman with type 1 diabetes with an A1C of 8.1 percent on an insulin pump with known mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Her previous pregnancy four years ago had uh, was delivered by C-section. The birth weight of her child was 9 pounds and 10 ounces, and the baby was monitored in the NICU for hypoglycemia. On exam, she's notable to have a BMI of 30. Her blood pressure is 120 over 72, heart rate of 70. And she asked, how can she plan for a healthy pregnancy? So diabetes in preg pregnancy is becoming more prevalent, and based on the screening test that's used, it can be up to 18% of pregnancies that are complicated by gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is much more common than pre-existing diabetes. And the prevalence of both gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes is increasing with the increasing rates of obesity within the US. This is the CDC prevalence of gestational diabetes showing an increase over the years. And we see that increase is particularly uh, more prevalent in older uh, women. So what are the risks of having diabetes in pregnancy, both uh, pre-existing diabetes in pregnancy and also gestational diabetes? There are increased rates of spontaneous abortion, preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, progression of chronic complications of pre-existing diabetes, hypoglycemia, infections such as pyelonephritis, ketoacidosis, polyhydramnios, which is related to a fetal polyuria, preterm labor, seizures, increased need for cesarean delivery, and also we know that gestational diabetes is an increased risk for subsequent development of type 2 diabetes. There are also significant risks to the fetus, including increased congenital malformations. This is important, especially when there's pre-existing diabetes, hyperglycemia, and the diabetes is poorly controlled. There's a much higher risk of cardiac and neural tube defects. During pregnancy, we know there's an increased risk of macrosomia, and that increases with the increasing levels of hyperglycemia, which can result in birth injuries, shoulder dystocia. There's also increased risk of hypoglycemia in the baby and increased core blood serum C peptide levels. There can also be an increased risk of premature birth, uh, intrauterine growth retardation, and low birth weight, respiratory distress syndrome, hyperbilirubinemia, and then we know that for children who are born, 
they have an increased risk of childhood obesity in the future and a later increased risk of type 2 diabetes. So gestational diabetes occurs due to the changes that occur in the pregnant woman. The placental hormones will increase insulin resistance. These increase significantly in the second half of the pregnancy, and this happens naturally to provide more nutrition for the fetus. There are multiple hormones that increase the insulin resistance. One of them is human placental lactogen, HPL, which decreases insulin sensitivity and increases lipolysis and free fatty acids. There's also normally an increased maternal hepatic glucose production, and normally there's an increased insulin production. Now, if somehow this insulin production is impaired, and that could be from genetics or a chronic insulin resistance, there is a more of a diabetogenic state. These factors all lead to impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes, and we know that women who have gestational diabetes during their pregnancies have a much increased risk of future type 2 diabetes with more than a 35% chance of type 2 diabetes over the next 20 years. We're getting a picture into their insulin resistance state into the future. So we know that if we make interventions at this time, that these can possibly be um, lifelong uh, modifications that can be learned. What are the risk factors for gestational diabetes? They are obesity, advanced maternal age, previous history of gestational diabetes, or a history that there was a previous pregnancy with a large baby greater than nine pounds, and that's thought that perhaps there was an undiagnosed gestational diabetes or a hyperglycemia or um, glucose intolerance that was not diagnosed. Also, a history of diabetes in a first degree relative, same as the risk with a um, relative um, developing type 2 diabetes, there's also a gestational diabetes. So screening usually occurs between 24 to 28 weeks. This is in that time period when those placental hormones are increasing and in insulin resistance is increasing. And those who are not previously diagnosed with overt diabetes. The screening can be done earlier in women that are thought to have an increased risk. And they're done by two different methods. So the most um, commonly used method um, that's recommended by ACOG the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology is the two-step method. And the first step involves a non-fasting 50-gram oral glucose tolerance test. And after one hour, the blood glucose is drawn. And this is uh, not a finger stick, but it has to be actual um, blood test. And there are different cutoffs that have been proposed, um, usually either 140, 135, or 130. Now, if we say that it's 135, um, that will reflexively go into the second step. Some advocate that if we um, are not at 130, then we could actually miss some cases. Then if there's a reading that's 135 or greater, the second step is to move towards the 100 gram oral glucose tolerance test, and this is a fasting test. And then if the fasting is greater than 95, or um, one hour greater than 180, two hours greater than 155, or three hours greater than 140, then we've said that the uh, two cutoffs are reached and the uh, woman has gestational diabetes. If we see that the fasting already is greater than 126, then we know that that's actually type 2 diabetes. Another proposed method for detecting gestational diabetes is not to do two steps, but actually just to do a one-step test. And that would use a 75-gram oral glucose tolerance test. And this would also be a fasting test with just using one cutoff. So a fasting of greater than 92, one hour at 180, or two hours greater than 153. And any one of these would uh, deem the woman to have gestational diabetes. This will have an increased prevalence of gestational diabetes, but that'll also include cases that can be managed with diet. So what about women who have pre-existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Where can we make an intervention before they're pregnant so that we can have the best outcomes for a safe and healthy pregnancy? So for all women who are not planning pregnancy, we counsel on effective contraception. And then for women who are planning pregnancy, reviewing the risk of uncontrolled diabetes, many women are not aware 
of the risks of hyperglycemia and uncontrolled diabetes in the uh, conception phase and also in the organogenesis phase of the pregnancy. Also, many patients are on common medications that need to be reviewed and um, considered if they should be stopped or held while they're um, planning pregnancy. The ones that are noted to be contraindicated and absolutely cannot be continued would be ACE inhibitors, ARBs, statins. And then actually most diabetes medications other than insulin are not considered safe for pregnancy. I'll go over the ones that are considered safe, but it really is um, a paradigm shift when they're planning for pregnancy in terms of having them on a safe regimen and trying to reach their goals. So the preconception goals for women with pre-existing diabetes. At least an A1C less than 7%. Some advocate even for an A1C less than 6.5% without significant hypoglycemia. And then also to encourage a healthy diet and exercise. And for those patients that are overweight and obese, advocating for healthy weight loss before conception because there is an expected weight gain during pregnancy and pregnancy is not the time for weight loss. To help take care of the patient, we need also a team approach. And there's many different aspects in which the team um, relies on each other to help the patient who's at the center. So the um, OB midwife works with the various specialists, including um, any types of comorbid diseases that the patient may already have. So the patient may need to see the ophthalmologist beforehand for diabetic retinopathy, when there's improvement in the A1C, there can be a potential worsening of diabetic retinopathy, so it would be important to see the uh, ophthalmologist every trimester. It's essential to meet with the nutritionist on a regular basis, and that's for gestational diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Because of the increased insulin <coughs> resistance, their diet may need to be adjusted in terms of their carbohydrates. Working closely with the endocrinologist and any other specialist that might be involved. And all of the aspects of the patient's care really has to be addressed, including the appropriate weight gain and weight management with a healthy diet and exercise, uh, glucose monitoring, that would be um, fasting and also one hour after meals. For someone that has uh, type 1 diabetes, that would also include pre-meal testing and also monitoring for hypoglycemia working together on medications so that they're on safe medications before conception, and then also throughout the pregnancy, and also during the phase of uh, lactation, and then monitoring for any complications that occur uh, during the pregnancy. All of these aspects are essential um, for the team to work together, and most importantly, um, for the patient to be at the center of that because they are the most important advocates for their own health and for um, the child in this area. And this is also one of the reasons why this area is so interesting because there's um, a change that occurs and a shift in uh, motivation so that we see that there's actual improvements in diet, actual improvements in activity levels um, that's harder to see when we're just uh, regularly following patients. And there's also importance of medication adherence. So it's a nice time to highlight all of these changes. And we can actually make a big difference in a small window of opportunity to um, affect um, changes that will affect the mother and also um, the child. So medical nutrition therapy, these are just some general recommendations and they have to be tailored for each uh, patient, but includes healthy, low carbohydrate, high fiber sources of nutrition. Fresh vegetables are the preferred carbohydrate sources. And patients can be taught um, to count carbohydrates and adjust their intake based on their fasting and postprandial glucose readings. They are also advised to avoid sugars, simple carbohydrates, highly processed foods, and juices. And also advised to have small, frequent meals to reduce the risk of ketosis and also of a postprandial hyperglycemia. 
and exercise, unless it's contraindicated for some reason uh, due to the pregnancy. We encourage daily physical activity such as walking and other pregnancy safe exercises. We find that exercise improves glycemic control and it's essential to monitor for hypoglycemia before exercise. Um, they can have a snack and also afterwards so that we don't have any complications of the activity. The um, weight management is based on the BMI that's measured before the pregnancy, so there are different goals set if they're in the normal weight category, overweight or obese category. And we try to um, achieve this with a balanced diet and regular exercise. Now there are different goals that are placed um, during pregnancy that are much stricter than the usual goals that we have for people with uh, diabetes. And the um, ACOG uh, guidelines will um, recommend a one hour postprandial glucose of less than 140. But even with these glucose levels, there are still risks of hyperglycemia and um, macrosomia that have been found. So ideally, it would be best to aim for near normal glycemic control. Normal fasting glucose in a pregnant woman is actually lower because of the uh, need for glucose for the fetus. So a normal glucose could be 75. And um, usually it doesn't go, uh, the one hour postprandials should not go beyond 126. So if we can aim for a similar goal in our pregnant patients, then we can reduce the risk dramatically. And tighter goals will pre prevent the maternal and fetal complications. So a fasting glucose between 60 to 90 and then one hour postprandial glucose of less than 120. And these are also um, taken into account that we don't have any significant hypoglycemia. So based on the specific patient, we may adjust these goals. If a type one um, patient has a lot of hypoglycemia, we may say that um, 70 to 90 may be acceptable and one hour postprandial may go up to 130. So each of these programs is tailored for the patient. Another area that is um, helpful with technology in the control of um, diabetes, this is a patient with type 1 diabetes who's wearing an insulin pump and then also has a continuous glucose monitor. Now, continuous glucose monitoring uh, involves the use of a subcutaneous sensor in the abdominal wall that measures the interstitial fluid glucose concentration. This interstitial fluid is different from the actual serum blood glucose, so the continuous monitor still needs to be calibrated using the finger stick glucose. Um, this requires patient education on learning how to use the continuous glucose monitor and also the provider interpretation to know how to use this data to adjust the medication regimen. There was a randomized controlled trial that compared continuous glucose monitoring versus just self-monitoring, and it showed that there was actual improved glycemic control using the continuous glucose monitoring and decreased rates of macrosomia. So this is something that's available and considered in the appropriate patient um, for improving glycemic control. So for patients that have pre-existing diabetes or are diagnosed with um, gestational diabetes, will have to use diet and exercise if that's not adequate to maintain them in the glycemic goals that we listed, then we'll use medications. It's important to review what medications are considered safe and acceptable and what risk is acceptable. And in diabetes, we try to use medications that are um, category B and we'll see that based on the risk of the disease, we may move into other categories. So when I speak about thyroid diseases, we actually use um, other medications as well, weighing in each case the risks and benefits. So just to review briefly, category A medications, there are controlled studies in pregnant women that do not show risk to the fetus in the first trimester and then also in subsequent trimesters. Category B, animal studies do not show risk to the fetus and there are no adequate studies in pregnant women. Category C, animal studies have shown an adverse effect on the fetus and there are no adequate studies in humans. Caution is advised. Benefits may warrant the use of the drug in pregnant women despite the potential risks. 
In category D, there's evidence of human fetal risk, and in serious conditions, these benefits may warrant the use of the drug in pregnant women despite potential risks. We're going to see this category in some of the antithyroidal medications that I'll discuss later. And then also category X, where studies have shown fetal abnormalities and the risks involved in use of the drug in pregnant women clearly outweigh potential benefits. These medications are contraindicated. Then there's also category N, where the FDA has not classified the drug. So for diabetes, the safest medication and the medication that will allow for the best control um, and allowing to reach the glycemic targets is insulin. So for patients that are, are, have pre-existing di diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, their insulin regimen may be the safest regimen or it may be, need to be transitioned, and that can easily be done either when they start planning for conception or when they conceive their um, insulin regimen can be transitioned to category B insulin. And also for gestational diabetes, um, if diet and exercise is not enough to maintain their glycemic control, we also recommend insulin. And the ones that are in category B would, for basal insulin are NPH or um, Levamir. Lantus is actually category C, and it's not been formally studied in pregnancy. For bolus insulin, we use the rapid-acting analogs Humalog or Novolog. And intermediate acting regular is also category B, even though it's not used as frequently now. For some patients, insulin is not um, an acceptable uh, treatment regimen. Um, and we may also use oral medications in gestational diabetes that are category B. These include metformin and gliburide. And it's important to counsel that they may not be sufficient to maintain a normal glycemic value. The long-term data on use during pregnancy is unknown. Another important aspect to monitor for is hypoglycemia. This can occur during maternal fasting because of the fetal absorption of glucose normally. And then there's an increased risk in patients who have pre-existing diabetes for a longer duration, have hypoglycemic unawareness, or are on high daily insulin doses. Some of the causes include excess insulin doses, skipping meals, or increased activity. And it's important to counsel women on these symptoms of hypoglycemia so that they can recognize them, including weakness, confusion, dizziness, anxiety, palpitations, tremor, sweating. And for those patients that are alert and able to eat or drink, it's uh, preferred to treat them with a glucose-containing drink, food, or using glucose tablets and educating patients on having small, frequent um, meals and uh, frequent glucose testing, and also um, to ensure that they are aware of their medication dosing and how that relates to eating food. For severe hypoglycemia, the risks are, uh, include seizures, loss of consciousness, accidents. And for um, a person that's not alert enough to treat themselves, um, they can be treated with glucagon by another individual and should be evaluated in the hospital. So we certainly want to avoid any significant hypoglycemia when we're trying to reach our treatment goals. During labor and delivery, there's also an increased risk of um, hypoglycemia. Um, just the work of labor will decrease their insulin requirements significantly. There's an increased um, need for glucose monitoring, and usually that'll occur every one to two hours during labor and delivery. Someone with gestational diabetes, their um, hormonal changes may occur that they don't require insulin during that time at all. And someone with type 1 diabetes, their insulin requirements will also drastically decrease, and their management should be closely followed by the diabetes consult so that they can be um, safely managed without risking any hypoglycemia and used through, um, through an insulin drip and a glucose drip. For the postpartum uh, time in lactation, insulin dosing decreases by approximately half. And those women that were previously on the oral medications, metformin and glyburide, are told to stop those medications as they are secreted in the breast milk. It's also important to monitor for hypoglycemia during breastfeeding. 
and some areas that we can provide recommendations is by reducing the insulin if they're um, on a continuous pump, reducing their basal insulin while they're breastfeeding, and also having a snack containing carbohydrates to avoid hypoglycemia. It's also essential to provide psychological support throughout this time. It can be an overwhelming um, diagnosis for some um, people and also um, because of the risks involved and the amount of self-management that's involved. So um, psychological support has been shown to improve pregnancy outcomes and the quality of life. It's essential to identify the barriers to care, including their um, possible uh, fears of hypoglycemia or any other um, challenge that they may be facing. And also, there's an increased risk for postpartum depression. We know that depression and diabetes are linked, and that's also true for gestational diabetes. So it's important to monitor them even um, throughout the postpartum time as well. So the myth is that gestational diabetes doesn't need to be taken seriously, as it'll disappear after a woman gives birth. And the fact is that it puts both the mother and the child at a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. So we have um, a, an important opportunity, and it's important to maintain a healthy lifestyle and follow up with monitoring because we know of the future risk of diabetes. So returning to our case of the 36-year-old with type 1 diabetes and A1C of 8.1, um, and mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with a previous pregnancy with macrosomia. Recommendations for our patient. We can recommend a preconception goal later um, less than 7%, so we would ask that she would, if possible, delay conception until she can um, achieve this goal of less than 7% without hypoglycemia. We would also screen for thyroid disease since type 1 diabetes is autoimmune. Due to her nef um, comorbid conditions, we'd also refer to ophthalmology and recommend follow-up examinations every trimester. Referral to the nutritionist for a diet program um, and looking at the carbohydrate count of foods and um, recommending exercise for a healthy weight loss before conception. Uh, close follow-up with the endocrinologist, and also um, for this patient that's already on an insulin pump, considering um, continuous glucose monitoring to help with improving glycemic control. So um, now transitioning, this painting is by Gustav Klimt, depicts a mother and child. Klimt is known for his Art Nouveau style, and we know this young mom might be fatigued, but uh, we think it's because she's postpartum, but maybe it's also from a thyroid condition. <laughs> so, beginning with the case, a 28-year-old presents two months postpartum with anxiety, insomnia, and palpitations. She had normal pregnancy and a healthy baby, attributing her symptoms to having a new baby. Her family history is significant for a brother with hypothyroidism. And on exam, she's noted to have a blood pressure of 112 over 68, heart rate of 104, a fine tremor, and clammy skin. The thyroid exam is normal and her labs show a TSH of 0.01. What is the natural course of this condition? So just to discuss the normal changes that occur during pregnancy and um, what happens with thyroid hormone. Maternal thyroid hormone crosses the placenta starting in the first trimester, and there's normally an increase in thyroid binding globulin, and the total T4 can increase up to 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. The fetal thyroid begins to function at 12 weeks of gestation. We know that thyroid hormone is incredibly important for the pregnancy. Um, cretinism is a disorder that affects areas of the world with severe dietary iodine deficiency, and there's severe hypothyroidism in both the mom and the fetus with impaired cognitive development and poor growth. The thyroid levels will change during pregnancy, and unless the lab specifies the trimester-specific ranges, we have to realize that what's considered a normal range has to be adjusted um, for what's an ideal range in the pregnancy and specifically in the trimester of the pregnancy. So in the first trimester, the TSH is normally between 0.1 to 2.5. Second trimester, 0.2 to 3. In the third trimester, 0.3 up to 3. 
Hypothyroidism affects up to 2% of pregnancies. The risks of untreated hypothyroidism are higher in overt hypothyroidism compared with subclinical hypothyroidism. And these risks include spontaneous abortion, preeclampsia, stillbirth, anemia, postpartum hemorrhage, preterm birth, and there's evidence that even subclinical hypothyroidism can affect the long-term IQ scores of the child. Certainly, if there's a history of hypothyroidism, it would be essential to monitor their thyroid function very normally, um, such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, a prior radioactive iodine ablation or prior thyroid surgery. We would measure their TSH and actually look for the preconception goal less than 2.5. And so a normal uh, TSH may not uh, be flagged, but if it's uh, greater than 2.5, it would be important to consider thyroid hormone replacement to bring it into the um, ideal goal. It's also essential to review the proper administration of thyroid hormone, which is usually first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, and asking patients to wait at least 30 minutes before um, food or medications. Medications that contain um, metals and especially the prenatal vitamin should be separated by at least four hours. So women who are planning pregnancy would be essential to counsel them on how to take their thyroid medication and how to separate that from their prenatal vitamin to get to the um, ideal goal. Now, since there is a normal increase in the thyroid hormone during pregnancy, we try to mimic that with our medication dosing. So automatically, when women become pregnant, we increase their levothyroxine dosage. And the average dose increase that's needed is about 30%. One way to achieve this easily is to recommend two additional pills during the week. For example, they'll take their normal dose, one pill, from Monday through Friday, two pills on Saturday and two pills on Sunday. And that's an effective way to immediately increase their dose um, by 30%. And that might happen in the very early weeks of their pregnancy, which is um, the critical time to have adequate thyroid hormone, and maybe even before they see their OB for the first time. And the TSH is monitored closely during the pregnancy. We'll monitor it every four weeks. There's also um, abnormal thyroid function tests that come up during pregnancy. We know the normal ranges in the first trimester. If the TSH is even lower than what's considered normal for that uh, first trimester, um, it may be actually due to um, an HCG-mediated hyperthyroidism, which is uh, occurring in one to 3% of pregnancies. There's um, a stimulating effect of HCG on the TSH receptor and HCG peaks towards the end of the first trimester. And that's also the same time that we tend to see this HCG-mediated hyperthyroidism. If there's higher um, levels of HCG, such as in a twin pregnancy, or um, in some other cases when there's very high levels of HCG, we'll see an even higher incidence of this um, hyperthyroidism. It can also be associated with hyperemesis gravidarum, and that should be treated with supportive therapy. And the importance of understanding these cases when it's an HCG-mediated hyperthyroidism versus a actual autoimmune thyroid disease is in the treatment, whether um, they'll use medications or if the thyroid function will improve on its own. So for HCG-mediated hyperthyroidism, there is no autoimmune um, cause here and antithyroidal drugs are not indicated and the serum T4 will return to normal. The TSH will take longer to recover, but we'll start to see all of the thyroid levels start to normalize. Graves' disease is less common during pregnancy, but can occur in 0.1 to 1% of all pregnancies. And the signs that this might actually be Graves' disease versus an HCG-mediated hyperthyroidism would be the clinical signs of Graves, including a goiter, a brewery, uh, Graves' orbitopathy. And when we check the labs, we see that the TSH receptor antibody or, um, is positive. Now, to determine the diagnosis, we do not use radioactive iodine uptake and scan. Um, it's contraindicated during pregnancy. For women that have pre-existing Graves' disease, it's important to have um, preconception counseling. The goal is to be euthyroid before trying to conceive. So 
of the options of surgery, radioiodine ablation, and medications, we review all of the risks and benefits of each one. Surgery is an alternative option because it will decrease the antibody levels. Radioiodine ablation can increase the um, thyroid receptor antibody levels, and um, before any radioiodine treatment, a pregnancy test is performed to, expose, um, to avoid any exposure to the fetus. And then conception should be delayed for at least six months, even one year, um, post ablation to adjust the levothyroxine dose for the gold TSH uh, pre-pregnancy, which is 0 0.3 to 2.5. For women who have Graves' disease during pregnancy, there are significant risks of uncontrolled thyrotoxicosis, including spontaneous abortion, pregnancy-induced hypertension, prematurity, intrauterine growth restriction, low birth weight, stillbirth, and then also thyroid storm and maternal congestive heart failure. The drugs that are used for Graves' disease in pregnancy um, also carry their own risks, so they have to be administered very carefully and monitored um, carefully and used for the shortest amount of time that's needed. This is also the reason that um, they may not be the first recommendation for a woman who's planning pregnancy because we know that they're not the ideal medications to use during pregnancy. So the antithyroid drugs um, inhibit thyroid hormone synthesis. During the first trimester, it's recommended to use purple thiouracil, or PTU. Um, there is a risk of hepatotoxicity with PTU, so after the first trimester, it's recommended to switch to methimazole. Methimazole does have rare risk of congenital malformations, including aplasia cutis. This is the scalp alopecia. Uh, and, and a phenomenon of MMI embryopathy, which includes quenal atresia, esophageal atresia, and dysmorphic facies. The treatment of uh, Graves' disease also may um, include a beta blocker for symptomatic treatment, and it may be stopped after two to four weeks if um, the heart rate and palpitations are improved, because there are long-term risks of beta blockers, including intrauterine growth restriction, fetal bradycardia, and neonatal hypoglycemia. For uh, women who are on these medications, we try to monitor them closely and reach their treatment goals so that they are not over-medicated. Um, both PTU and methimazole cross the placenta, and we try to avoid any over-treatment, which can lead to a fetal goiter and fetal hypothyroidism. Thyroid function tests have to be monitored very closely, including uh, free T4 and uh, total T4, TSH. They can be monitored as frequently as every two to four weeks. The total T4 level we know is increased because of the increased TBG. The TSH may stay suppressed for some time as it'll take a longer time to recover. So that's why the full panel is helpful. Um, T3 can also be monitored, but it's also another um, hormone that does not need to be normalized. If it's normalized um, according to the laboratory normal values, then the TSH may increase um, too much. And then after monitoring for every two to four weeks and the targets are reached, then the labs can be monitored every four to six weeks. The uh, serum-free T4 should be targeted towards um, slightly above the normal reference range. The natural course of Graves' disease in pregnancy is a gradual improvement in the second and third trimesters where we're able to decrease the medication dose. And oftentimes, we're able to stop the antithyroidal medications in 20 to 30 percent of patients in the last trimester. It's essential to monitor um, the fetus as well while treating for active Graves' disease in pregnancy. And the uh, TSH receptor antibody will start to uh, decrease, but it can be measured um, between 20 to 28 weeks. There are various recommendations on when exactly to measure this, um, but this shows an increased risk for the fetus because a high titer um, puts the fetus at risk for neonatal um, hypothyroid, hyperthyroidism. And if it's above three times the upper limit of normal, then that would be an even um, greater indication for very close monitoring on the ultrasound. And the ultrasound has multiple parameters that can measure um, the fetal tachycardia, and that would be 170 beats per minute persistently over 10 minutes. 
looking for um, size so we could measure for intrauterine uh, growth restriction, looking out for a fetal goiter, accelerated uh, bone maturation, and then also looking at fluid levels and signs of congestive heart failure or fetal high drops. In the postpartum time and during lactation, the methimazole um, and PTU can be continued. They are safe. So methimazole can be used in doses up to 20 to 30 milligrams per day uh, in divided doses and PTU up to 300 milligrams per day. Um, that's considered second line because of the concerns of hepatotoxicity, but can be used if there was an allergic reaction to the methimazole. And if um, the woman is breastfeeding, then it can be administered following um, breastfeeding and in divided doses throughout the days. Another um, common um, condition that we see in women who are recently postpartum is thyroiditis. And this is um, women who don't have any known thyroid disease and have normal thyroid function during their pregnancy when they were evaluated. This is the most common cause of thyroid toxicosis in the postpartum time. The prevalence is 5 to 10 percent, and it's much more common than um, Graves' disease in the postpartum period. It's thought to occur due to a rebound of the immune system, so when we evaluate, we actually do find that they have thyroid antibodies, including TPO antibody and thyroglobulin antibody. And there's thought to be an immunosuppressive um, nature to pregnancy and then a rebound after the postpartum time. And there's a course that the postpartum thyroiditis will follow. Not each patient will follow the same course. Usually the first um, phase is the hyperthyroid phase, which in the first six months after delivery. And this may not be symptomatic at all. And this could be followed by a spontaneous remission um, back into the euthyroid phase. Or um, the uh, woman could progress into a hypothyroid phase, which can be from three to 12 months. And this tends to be more symptomatic and when a lot of uh, women present. And, and then after that, there can be um, a return to the euthyroid. Um, there are women who have uh, permanent hypothyroidism, and that can occur in 10 to 20% of cases of postpartum thyroiditis. So they will require close uh, monitoring to see if their thyroid function tests normalize on their own, or if they become so symptomatic that they actually do need treatment. If a radioiodine uptake scan is deemed necessary and it's performed, it would be considered low in postpartum thyroiditis, and it would be, um, if it was uh, Graves' disease, for example, then the uptake would be very high. And it can be done in a woman who's postpartum, but the breast milk, if she is um, breastfeeding, cannot be used for several days after the scan. Um, I-123 I or technetium can be used, um, and it's considered um, uh, safer, but um, for breastfeeding, um, it may not be uh, useful for, for several days afterwards. Another area that comes um, up during pregnancy is thyroid nodules, and these can be found on exam, and oftentimes this may be the first time that they may be having um, a thyroid exam if that's their um, contact with um, medical care. So also there's uh, an increased uh, prevalence of thyroid nodules, and that varies um, based on the studies throughout the world um, between 3% and 21%. It's important to obtain an, um, a history of thyroid disease and also a physical exam of the thyroid nodules to evaluate the serum uh, TSH because there might be um, a hyperfunctioning nodule and also um, to evaluate with a neck ultrasound, which is safe. Those thyroid nodules that have any suspicious ultrasound features can be considered for an FNA. An FNA is safe in any trimester of the pregnancy. And to evaluate thyroid nodules, uh, we would not use a radioiodine uptake and scan because that's contraindicated during pregnancy. For those uh, nodules that we deem um, suspicious that undergo an FNA and are found to have thyroid cancer, if the thyroid cancer is, for example, a papillary, uh, well-differentiated thyroid cancer and um, is not spread, then surgery may actually be deferred until the postpartum time because there's no significant difference in the prognosis. 
if it's a more aggressive type of thyroid cancer, such as medullary thyroid cancer, a large primary tumor, or extensive lymph node metastases, then surgery can occur um, during the second trimester. For patients that have a history of, three, of uh, treated thyroid cancer, and this is um, many p patients that we see who have a history of um, hypothyroidism actually due to a, a treated thyroid cancer, the TSH goals are also adjusted preconception, and that TSH suppression will be the same level of suppression um, that they had uh, preconception that should be maintained during their pregnancy. And that's based on how much residual or recurrent disease they have that can be evidenced by thyroglobulin measurements or by neck ultrasound. So for women with known persistent disease, the goal TSH would be less than 0.1 preconception and throughout the pregnancy. For a high-risk tumor that's clinically and biochemically free of disease, TSH suppression can be between a goal of 0.1 to 0.5. And then for low-risk patients who are free of disease, TSH can be aimed for a low normal range of 0.3 to 1.5. For those patients who have not undergone remnant ablation they, and are clinically free of disease, their TSH can also be in the low normal range from 0.3 to 1.5. And then they also, during their um, pregnancy, would require the 30% increase in the dose of their levothyroxine. So returning to our case of the 28-year-old um, woman who's two months postpartum with anxiety, insomnia, palpitations, um, exam showing a heart rate of 104, tremor, clammy skin, and TSH of 0 0.01. The natural course of this condition is due to the postpartum thyroiditis that should normalize back to a euthyroid state. So our patient is here in the hyperthyroid phase, which occurs in the first um, six months postpartum, where the TSH is low and the T4 and T3 are high. Now that can normalize down into the euthyroid phase and remain there, or it can become hypothyroid, where the T4 and T3 are low and the TSH rises to a hypothyroid phase. And then women can either go back into the euthyroid phase, where the TSH, T4, and T3 are again in the euthyroid phase, or they can remain permanently hypothyroid, where their TSH remains elevated. In order to know the natural course, it would be essential to monitor the thyroid function regularly and to monitor the TSH every two months. If the, during the hypothyroid phase, they're very symptomatic, or if they're breastfeeding, planning another pregnancy, or if that hypothyroid phase exceeds six months, that would be a reason to treat. If there is treatment um, and the symptoms are improving, there's also an option if they're not um, breastfeeding or planning pregnancy to try to taper the thyroid dose to see if this is postpartum thyroiditis and re will resolve on its own. And if um, they return back to their euthyroid state, it's important to know that they could have an underlying thyroid condition. So that's why checking the TPO antibody would be helpful and continuing to monitor the TSH on a yearly basis. So I'd like to thank um, Department of Medicine for inviting me to give this talk, Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Bone Diseases. The Mount Sinai Diabetes Center, Dr. Yaron Tomer, Dr. Derek Leroy, Dr. Carol Levy, who's been a mentor for me in this area of endocrine disorders in pregnancy, and also the Department of OBGYN and the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine. Thank you all. polycystic ovary um, syndrome, helping with uh, fertility and decreasing uh, insulin resistance, but there is an increased risk of gestational diabetes for women that have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So in that um, situation, metformin may be a useful um, medication. In your second case, the woman came in with anxiety, and uh, do you just wait it out? 
in, ter in terms of you know te checking the TSH, she also had the so, high heart rate and stuff like right. that. Right. So we can use a beta blocker such as propanolol to treat for symptomatic um, um, hyperthyroidism. What we would not use is antithyroidal medications, though. But we can use the beta blocker. Is she breastfeed then? Um, yes, there is. Uh, you, she can breastfeed. Okay. You uh, advocated for tighter glucose control during pregnancy. Doesn't that lead to an increased uh, risk of hypoglycemia in both mother and fetus? So there is an increased risk of hypoglycemia every time we try to have tighter control. Um, but in practice, when we are uh, very careful about their carbohydrates and also about their medications and making um, weekly adjustments on their medications, we are able to achieve those types of goals. Uh, of course, it depends on the patient, someone with pre-existing diabetes who never had glucose levels in that range will, yes, experience more hypoglycemia trying to achieve that. So we try to um, go stepwise and at least get them below 140. But for someone who has gestational diabetes who never had pre-existing diabetes, we can certainly aim for a goal less than 120, and that is the recommendation I use in my practice. Terry. Shirley, it's very nice, thank you. Um, for the residents who are here, I think it's important to emphasize that thyrotoxicosis in pregnancy is a very dangerous condition. It's not something to be taken lightly, particularly in the ER. In my many years now, I've seen a number of catastrophes, usually by uh, 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 ER personnel taking this as a rather unimportant association. But most women who come into the ER with un uncontrolled thyrotoxicosis in pregnancy should be in the ICU. And it really is a very dangerous condition for both mother and child. Uh, question is, for the women with hypothyroidism, do you have them increase their, their thyroid as soon as they have a positive pregnancy test? Yes. Yeah. So we actually ask them to call us uh, when they become pregnant and we advise them to increase their dose. The way we use the um, extra two pills per week allows them to use the medication they already have so that they, they don't even need to wait for a new prescription. So we, we typically tell our patients, I want, I want to be the third person you call. <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot of people aren't called by endocrinologists, so a lot well, of people... Well, you become the third person. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted to call them. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.